Hey there my friends, day 39 of this vlog as we continue to wrestle with what it means to be the church, the people of God, as our temple space isn't available to us that around our tables, the precious word of God continues to encourage us to develop the character and competencies of Jesus. That's what discipleship looks like in this, in any context. And even though it's difficult to imagine what it's like to be together with masks and other uh, things that we're not used to, I'm looking forward to the time and space where our temple space will be available to us. And the elders and I are working at on that right now here at Emmanuel. But for the time being, maybe just a moment of, of, uh, of real life for a moment. Um, this is Thursday and so I'm, uh, kind of a tight shooting schedule today to get this done and also stuff for tomorrow. Uh, Friday is still a day off and a family day and to try to put all those things together. I've really enjoyed having Jared and Natalie as part of the conversations but that puts a few other things on my on my plate to do and um, getting some stuff read and ready to talk about. So it's just been a scrum and if your life is anything like mine, um, you look at your watch and you go, where has the morning gone? So that's kind of where I am right now. Um, a few thoughts about Acts 4. Uh, we, we see just a, a couple of chapters in Acts 2 and 3 where Peter and the apostles are boldly proclaiming the truth about who God is and who Jesus is in relation to that. And this is the point where the hammer starts to come down. And the the thing that continues to um, amaze me is not just the boldness of Peter and the apostles who just a few weeks before this have been scattered and afraid and not willing to stand with Jesus now are willing to do something that is just kind of the complete opposite. If you think about Peter on Monday, Thursday and Good Friday, he's the one who his, his deepest fear would be standing before the, the Sanhedrin and having to kind of defend himself and the one that he, his master, the one he purports to follow. And he fails that test miserably. What happens in, in Acts chapter 4? That exact thing. And it is a testament not to the change of a man by human means, but the power of the Holy Spirit working in him that changes this whole thing around. So I, I love it how, how um, Peter and John standing before Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin, verse 7, after they had Peter and John stand before them, they began to question them, by what power or in what name have you done this, this healing of this man and the, the preaching that came on the other side of it and the, the change, the transformation of the hearts of the people of Jerusalem. Verse 8 tells the story. Then Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today about a good deed done to a disabled man, and by what means he was healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing here before you healthy. So not only does Peter stand before the Sanhedrin and have his worst nightmare realized, but it's not a nightmare now because he kind of has this devil may care, winner take all attitude. Like, what have I got to lose? If I'm to be martyred for this cause, then I'm okay with that. If Jesus was willing to die a terrible death and see resurrection on the other side of it, that's what I have to look for. I'm going to be bold and stand up for what is real. So not, he says his his, his sermon, he's had a couple of, of, of practiced runs here for this sermon. He's able to look at the Jewish leaders and say, you put Jesus on the cross, that's right. But on the other side of that, there is forgiveness for you. Uh, the, the stone the, the, the rejected by you builders is how my translation puts it, which has become the cornerstone. Um, there's salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. So there's a boldness and a, a, a willingness to lean into something that before was a real point of, of, of fear and, uh, and uh, worry about what would happen after this. They don't do that. They go right at it. They face these Jewish leaders and proclaim the truth of what they've seen and heard. That's what it means to be a witness. Um, just a, a really encouraging thing. And on the other side of this, they, they, they threaten the disciples and say, don't say this. Don't say anything more. Peter and John answer them in verse 19, whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than God, you decide. Like, they put the onus totally on the Sanhedrin. 
um, for we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. And it's not just them who have seen and heard this, it's others who kind of start to put the dots together. And the Sanhedrin are helpless when it comes to this. They can't really do anything against them. And we'll see um, in, in the next entry kind of what uh, chapter 5 brings about and, and their unwillingness to kind of put a gag order on them completely by force. The, the chapter concludes with a prayer for boldness, that they know that the Spirit of God is with them. And if you observe the kind of general arc of the story here, it's a story of very powerful forces in Jerusalem trying to stop the message of Jesus of Nazareth and God not allowing that to happen. That the power of the Spirit and the, the, the force of God Almighty to make sure this message isn't quenched, but there's a, a fire that continues to burn and spreads, that's what the story of the early church is. And it's marvelous to behold when you see that. And that's, once again, not by human force or intellect. It is purely the power of God's Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus living in these people that drives it forward. I'm going to turn it over to Jared for Proverbs and Natalie now, and I'll catch you on the other side of that. So today is May 7th, so we're looking at Proverbs 7. Jared, which uh, verse from Proverbs 7 did you choose to focus on? Well, I liked um, 2 and 3. Keep my commandments and live. Keep my teaching as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So it's just a good reminder to always listen to people when they just want to sit down and have a good conversation because because later on in your life you could really use that information and wisdom mm -hmm. in some situations. Right, and you never know when you're going to get yourself in a situation where you need that wisdom. I think the rest of the chapter describes a pretty uncomfortable scenario, but the thing that I'm taking away from it... Uh, Verse 7, I saw among the inexperienced, this, the person who's writing this says, they're looking down into the street and seeing someone uh, among the inexperienced, I noticed among the youths, a young man lacking sense. And he puts himself in a situation where sin can be right at his door, so to speak. And it just reminded me, the whole chapter reminds me of how tantalizing the devil can make sin to be. It looks like it's fun. It looks like it's good. It can, there's, there's no risk in it. And yet we know that on the other side of it, it's often very deadly to the things that we treasure and love and want to be about. So it's a good reminder to us at all ages not to take the devil's bait. Yeah, wise words. Well, thanks for having the conversation today. You're welcome. So we're talking about chapter 11 today of Adoring the Dark. It's entitled Selectivity. And Peterson kind of bores down into the concept of not talking about a whole bunch of different things with a piece of art, but trying to be really selective and pare it down to just the essential ideas, and that that's going to serve the audience better. Uh, Natalie, what are this out of this chapter kind of stood out to you? Well, I would, when Peterson said, selectivity means choosing what not to say. It means aiming at the bullseye. It means making sure the song is about one specific thing so that when folks are driving home from the show, they can say, remember the one he wrote for his son? Yeah, yeah. So, for you, Natalie, what's the purpose of being selective about what you're going to produce? Well, it means um, crafting something t to be meaningful and memorable. Like, not people are going to hear it one day and it's going to go in one ear and out the other and then forget it the next day. I want it to be something that leaves a mark on people. It's going to stick with them as they mm -hmm. go. And we kind of have talked about Hamilton and how Hamilton's one big driving force is I want to be meaningful, I want to leave a legacy, I want to do something that people will remember. I'm not going to throw away my oh, shot. shot. Yeah. Yeah, and I feel exactly the same way. I want to leave behind a legacy and to have to say, look back um, and say, you know, I did something with my life. I feel very much the same. Yeah, so what stood yeah. out to you? Um, for, for me, I, there were a lot of things in here that really resonated with me. It reminded me of something that one of my seminary professors told me once, uh, our whole class, um, Rev Rossow. He said um, in Hom 2, guys, write sniper rifle sermons, not shotgun sermons. And what he was really saying is focus on one thing, make sure you hit the mark, 
you're really, really focused instead of, if you know about anything about shotguns, they spray bullets all over the place. Where sniper rifles, I'm hitting one target. So be selective in the things you talk about. And I think at the end of this chapter, the reminder from John 21, that at the end, um, John to his audience kind of has this, this aside of, of, hey, we could have spoken so many things about Jesus. We, the, the world is gonna be filled with books about Jesus, but these things are written so that you may believe there's a purpose for it. And I'm hoping someday to hear some more of those stories about what Jesus did while he was here, but this is what we have and this is enough and it's good. Yeah, and so how do we imitate that as well as creators being selective about what we choose to write about? It's really good. Well, thanks for being willing to have a little conversation. No problem. Well, my friends, that's all I've got for you for today. So for the time being, stay connected to God's word. Be well, look out for your neighbors and those around you, and I will see you tomorrow. God's peace to you. Pastor out.